Hello, this is David Morales, CEO and founding developer of VZ, Visual Zen. Our purpose, building better pathways for student and supporter success. Our topic today, the parent handoff. What does that mean? Well, I have a special guest. Hi, Chelsea. Hi, Dave. Uh, before we actually get to know a little bit about you, um, I, I want to explain, usually I do it the other way around, where you explain what the topic is. I'm going to explain what the topic is, because that's why I invited you. Um, part of our uh, process at VZ is understanding the onboarding of incoming uh, students and supporters. Uh, this was the first year that we went to AHEP, and where I formally got to meet Chelsea. And part of why we were there, a lot of people didn't understand because it was mainly for family engagement. But we have learned very strategically that our product has been pushed in a good way um, towards better supporter engagement. And no better than for me to do an interview with Chelsea, and we're going to discuss the parent handoff, which means in our world, we generally have what's called a missions handoff and transition. At the end of the onboarding, we have some type of supporter handoff or parent handoff. And what the hell happens after that? Right. Generally, orientation professionals don't care. Look, they care today. I'm going to tell you what happened earlier this week. And again, this is why we're doing the topic, because it's very relevant. And I think let's get to it. But first, let's know a little bit about you, Chelsea. Tell us, how the hell did you get into the position you are today? One as director and the role you have at RIT. That's a really good question, David. Um, I am definitely fall into the category of people that just fell into the role and knew nothing about it, did not plan on this job. Um, so to rewind back, I was working on my master's and PhD in the Department of Family Social Science at the University of Minnesota. Uh, so what that meant was I did a lot of research and teaching, and I thought my job was going to be in academia on the faculty and research side of the institution. And then right as I finished up my master's degree and was transitioning into my PhD, I needed an assistantship to help pay my way. And my advisor said, hey, I know this person who works over in student affairs, and I think you would really work well with her. And so my advisor connected me with Marjorie Savage, who was, at the time was the director of the parent program at the University of Minnesota. Well, by the way, that was episode three when I interviewed you. I had no idea that was the reason. That's that what, is, absolutely. I, I mean, very honest. Like, wow. Okay, cool. Yeah, Sorry. so Marge hired me to help her do assessment and research in her office. I was hired as a research assistant for, you know, 10 hours a week. And over the next few years, she gave me more and more hours and more and more responsibilities. And I eventually started running events and responding to parents and managing the student team. And I realized that I really, really liked that hands-on work with parents where I could take what I was doing with my PhD and that research assessment piece, but really it, it, uh, apply it directly to parents. And so my whole kind of traje trajectory changed. And I, before I actually defended my dissertation, I was hired on as her assistant director and I not that's how I got into the parent field. It was it was pure luck and working with the right people at the right time. Um, so I worked there for a couple of years as the assistant director. And then the opportunity to come to RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology, came up in 2015. And it was to establish the parent program here. And so that was really cool, an opportunity to take something that was not there and build it from the ground up. So I've been here since 2015 and it has been it's been really, really an amazing opportunity to have my own program and, you know, to work with others in the field and work with my partners here at RIT and really build a community of parents as partners and, um, you know, really strengthening our relationships with families and supporters. Great uh, introduction. Uh, so why we're here today, uh, since the audience got to learn you a little bit, let's learn the audience. Uh, when we started, we had no idea who the hell was listening. And uh, as I keep calling all of our clients, we have 100 plus across the nation. And I went to AHEP and I went to no people came, kept coming up and I'm like, who else is going to be on your show next? And I asked, you listen to this? And it turned out to be not just orientation professionals like directors, but student leaders, uh, orientation leaders. And it's magically, somehow parents found us and they were more intrigued. Yeah, it was a crazy little spin. Um, and so we realized that our audience is, is quite a widespread but niche uh, in understanding. Their goal really is to understand um, what's going on so they can start making better decisions. So today we're going to hit some pretty hot topics uh, with the parent handoff. And I just want to say some terminology. I'm going to switch between parent 
and supporter. And in our last episode we did, which we'll talk about, I, we had this whole funny debate of if you had to take the name family away, what would you replace it with that you can market with? You can't. It's family. Mm -hmm. But, but well, I'll, I'll be interchanging family, supporter, and parents so everyone knows that we're talking the same thing um, as we get into it. Uh, so I want to get a little bit more serious on uh, about your role currently so people can understand what you do on a day-in-day -day basis because uh, I have a particular item that kind of, it quotes you, so I'm reading it directly, is that the majority of parents that I work with are incoming or first-year parents, which makes sense, but parents are important beyond that. Uh, but is your role really more on a daily basis right now with incoming parents, or what are, you, what are you doing over there? Sure. You know, it really depends a lot on the time of year. I mean, obviously, starting in May, 99% of the parents I work with until September are the incoming parents as we prepare them to send their students to RIT and really help them be ready to be a parent of a college student. But I think... The reason why I said that is because parents of first year students are more likely to reach out to my office with questions uh, because, you know, once they're more experienced, they either know they don't need to reach out to me. They can reach out directly to financial aid or they have better communication with their students. But in that first year, they're really still learning what their role is as a as a parent of college student and really starting to learn their student as an independent adult. And so I definitely hear more from parents of new students. However, I do hear from parents across the student life cycle. It is not abnormal for me to hear from parents of third, fourth, fifth year students asking, you know, different questions than than first year parents for sure. Um, but yeah, we I definitely strive to work with all parents, even though a lot of it is focused on our new parents just because they're the ones who need the most help. Correct. Um, I always say this. I'm a math guy. So when I hear you talk very similar, it seems like there's a curve of the level of people, your, your audience, parents are mainly incoming, but there's this margin that kind of diminishes throughout the year. Mm -hmm. But you and I are both very intelligent and very understand that small thing needs to be addressed. And that's what we're talking about today is how to increase that engagement beyond onboarding, which is very important because that's what I bring to the table. I've spent 21 years building software for your colleagues for onboarding but only one school for what happens after the first year. It's incredible uh, that we've been around that long. Mm -hmm. But what has shifted is that small little margin that you're talking about the two, three, year four and five has grown. Um, so what, what I wanna talk about a little bit is just the, the history of supporter engagement to get to my you know, questions. Um, so you, you have the life cycle of a student that starts off uh, in the beginning with prospecting and recruiting. And the supporter really gets aligned because they're helping the student out. Mm -hmm. As a supporter helps through the onboarding process, uh, that supporter needs to be engaged in a, in a different set of mechanisms, not just answering questions by making phone calls to you, but having access to resources and, and things like that. Well, what we've learned is that a lot of the orientation professionals um, were separated from family programs, but family programs got brought back into the onboarding process. Um, and just so I can understand a little better, what did you ever, were you an OL yourself at one point? Were you managing a team of them or working in that space? Yeah, it's really funny. Every year when we have orientation at RIT and all the professional staff talks about, you know, how excited we are, everyone, everyone but me says, I was an OL or I was an RA and this is how I got engaged. And I was like, no, I never did that as a student and, um, you know, not really until I came to, to RIT and was very closely engaged with our orientation office did I work as closely with OLs as I do now. So that's, I have a different history than a lot of student affairs professionals. Well, I think that's the mindset we need. Um, so I want to tell you a little story that happened in the previous podcast. Uh, our clients, two of them, uh, Binghamton University and NCAP, uh, Betsy and Nicole, came to us and said, hey, we inherited Family Weekend. We know you're doing orientation session events, you're doing Welcome Week, you're doing even workshops and camps, and you're helping all into orientation professionals. Can you help us with this? We really didn't know what we were doing, um, except that we had done this for Christopher Newport University 17 years ago, where they came to us for alumni reunion, Family Weekend, University of uh, North Carolina Charlotte also came to us, but we never developed it out. We didn't think it was that important because our clients have really shaped our product because we listened to their problems. But when they came to us, it's not like they didn't know what to do. It was a responsibility put on their plate. 
And what I want to talk about is that responsibility transition. So again, to topic the parent handoff. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in your mind, just so I can understand, where do you see the orientation professional concentrating on the onboarding and stopping? Where is that stop point that you believe that needs to go to family engagement or family programs? How do you see uh, that level of where it is in the life cycle of the student? Right. I think that is a it can be a difficult question just because every institution looks really different of where the family programs fall or if they have family programs um, and how family programs are engaged with orientation. So I can say for RIT, I work so closely with our our orientation office that when it comes to families, it's me from the start. Um, basically, admissions hands them off to me and then I work with orientation to create that onboarding experience and then they continue with me. Um, but there are schools that don't have a me. And so I think it's different and or there are there are schools that completely run orientation and, can, and including family orientation and then do that handoff at, you know, move in or at orientation. So I think it depends on the institution. However, I will say that I think some overlap is very important because, you know, if a parent or a student is reaching out to the orientation office and builds those relationships, we don't want them to reach out to that office later and hear, well, you're not my problem anymore. You should reach out to so and so. And obviously that's an appropriate in some situations, you know, a parent might reach out to me and I have to pass them off because I can't answer their specific question, but I would really want those relationships to be strong so that if a student, you know, wants to reach out to their OL, cause that's who they know that the OL knows how to help them and get them to the next spot. Same with uh, pro professional staff. So I don't know that it's an exact moment, but I do hope that there's some overlap. Uh, you know, like for example, if family weekend is run under, a parent and family program office, I think it would be really valuable to have orientation staff as primary volunteers because they look familiar to students and to parents. So I think it should kind of be gradual, uh, depending on what the university layout looks like. Well, we've got plenty of time here, so I want to start slow so we all understand, because I believe the audience that's listening now uh, will be mainly the people from AHEP and a lot of people of our, our current clients listening. And I want to explain maybe to you, Chelsea, a little more why it's important to us. Uh, our product takes a student from the admissions transition, and there is a task list that's dynamic over a period of time, which we call periodization. So there's pre-orientation, orientation, and post-orientation, three kind of groupings. That spans about eight to 10 months. So you have a student coming in in January, February, March, needing to be doing what they're doing, and the tasks are based on their student uh, major, college maybe, campus, uh, student groups, honors, athletes, anything you can imagine to make sure that their experience is customized to that student. So during that 10 months, there's like an engagement path that tells them what they need to be doing next, whether they've completed or not, get text or email communications, have access to online orientation videos, um, event management that we had talked about. The reason why this conversation is important is because it is a series of steps. And always the question is, what's next? And that's the drop off I'm going to be talking with you in a bit. So knowing that mindset, we also built a supporter platform that runs in tandem with the student platform. Mm -hmm. So the onboarding process for the student has a task list, the onboarding process for a supporter has a task list that is uniquely in, uh, uh, customized to that supporter. So in your world, if you're saying the admissions gives me the responsibility of handling the supporters, I engage and work as a strategic partner, and there's only one you per se, all of our clients have leveraged our product because they don't have a you per se. Mm -hmm. So they have this platform that allows to guide the supporter on what the things they need to be doing, what questions and resources, and allow other uh, strategic or campus partners, I would say strategic partners, but campus partners coming into that supporter platform to help. Um, and OLs, uh, I believe one of our other schools has hired five new OLs only for family um, orientation for that transition away from orientation to help those people because it was very strategic. Um, so when we launched a platform for University of Connecticut, it was so darn successful, but they were early adopter, which means we haven't built this idea of helping supporters as onboarding until this year. So we understood the difference between a guest and a supporter. I guess this is someone attending the event, but a supporter could be the mom, dad, coach, somebody who may not come to that an actual event. So what's the point of having those OLs handling family orientation in person if that supporter wasn't already in the onboarding platform technology registered as a supporter? 
So we built an area where you can build uh, and add supporters for that engagement. So that's setting the mindset of why I'm asking you this is because we built that task list for the supporter, but guess what? It stopped. It stopped the day of orientation. Right. Uh, so from your experience is after physical orientation at RIT and all the colleagues that you've talked about, how do you handle the, the uh, supporter engagement or the parent engagement after uh, the student has been at orientation? Sure. So what I, I can tell you what I personally do, which um, one of the, what I consider one of the most important resources for parents out of my office, and I would argue for any institution is a newsletter and it goes out monthly. And the reason I say it's important is because it can be very timely and offer information right now that's important and it goes right to their inbox. So at RIT, my newsletter goes to about 37,000 email addresses. So it's, it's a really big, um, a big audience. And the reason I bring this up is because, you know, we know that during the admissions process and during the orientation process, students and supporters are given a lot of information, but they're not going to remember that information until issues arise. So that continuous proactive communication helps if a parent of a first year student doesn't hear until Thanksgiving that they're struggling with a class. Well, a lot of times when they're in the admissions and orientation process, both are going to be like, well, that's not going to be a problem for me. You know, my student did so well in high school, they're not going to have issues. So they're not going to remember it until suddenly they find out their student is struggling and then they need to go back and and remember what those resources are. And so I think that engage, this is why the engagement has to continue is because students don't encounter a lot of issues until after they're here. It, it absolutely does not end at orientation. And I would argue that that is not just the first year and it continues on into the second year as well. And I hope I'm not jumping ahead by saying this, but uh, just to share, I I do a big survey of my parents every other year. Oh, yeah, I was going to ask you that. Perfect. Yes. And so way back in 2017, one of the questions I ask is how familiar are you with campus resources in, and I list a bunch of areas, you know, academics, mental health, physical health, engagement. And what I found back in 2017 was if, if you looked at every single graph across student year, there was a huge drop in the second year across every single topic which makes sense when you think about the family lifestyle, life cycle, is that they get a lot of information in uh, admissions and orientation, and then their student doesn't encounter problems until their second year. And once their student encounters those problems, they're like, wait, what are the issues? And then after that, they remember the resources. And so I think that that to me was a huge light bulb moment. You know, we'd already heard of the sophomore slump and we knew we had to give our second year students some extra love, but this showed that families have the same struggles in trying to support their student when students were encountering these issues. Um, so the way I personally countered it is I have a print newsletter that goes to parents of second year students right before Thanksgiving that covers a lot of the topics we know are really big for those second year students. And I'll say in the last few years, I have not seen that seen that same graph again. So I'm, I hope that means that the newsletter makes a difference. Um, but to me, that was just a really clear sign that there continues to be questions. And if we stop talking to them at orientation, they're not going to know how to support their student. And at the end of the day, that's what all of our goals are, is helping those students be successful, whether it's us on campus or OLs at the start of the year or families uh, until the end. Well, I'm being repetitive for a reason, and I'll come back to your survey that is on my notes and why I think that's crucial research. Um, when we began VZO, we started for orientation reservations. There was a management system 21 years ago, so we only service a small period of time of any engagement. Even though if you registered early, you weren't doing much. You're saying, what event I want to go to. Then at orientation, you did advising, blah, blah, blah. When we took that periodization, extended it to pre-orientation, included pre-advising, how can we advise students better for enrollment needs and class capacity and you know teachers and resources? Um, that's when we got into early engagement uh, with the parent. So what we're talking about here is in this world that doesn't exist yet, and this is why I need your insight, and you gave me one, you said newsletter. I'm gonna ask you to have a crystal ball too, like, a, like you don't have to have the right answer. It's just, we're looking for help. When that, uh, I mentioned before, when that orientation's over, not every student you know, it's going to have that same date. It's going to be a little bit of a different date, what session they're going to and what parent. We found by including family weekend, which is in October for Binghamton and November for NCAT, every school is somewhere around that range. Mm -hmm. If you think of the, the move in and check in date, that's about one to two months, that November that you're talking about of that newsletter and helping. So if we have, and I'll tell you the percentages later, X amount of these supporters in the VZO system full attention, 
full, I'm talking about 100% engaged as much as we can. Now we're registering for Family Weekend, there's a gap. We have a task list, it's a tool, that's all it is. We don't have the resources to plug in there. We don't know, I said earlier, the next steps. So I would like to ask you, and I usually ask, save the crystal ball stuff for down the road a bit, be, be, I wanna save the other crystal ball stuff for second and third year, which we'll tackle. Um, what would you see other than a newsletter, knowing that you have the parents' attention, let's say July 19th in an orientation session, and they attended orientation and got the excited, if they saw a task list of things to do, one of them is register for family weekend, but they had three other things, what would you throw in there? So I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift this a little bit and throw this back at you. Task lists are really important, but something that I have realized that parents need are conversation starters. So it might not even just be these are the things you need to complete, but it will be these are the things you need to talk to your student about. And I have learned, especially over the past year, that parents need that. We can say like, hey, the career fair is coming up, but they don't know how to talk to their student about the career fair. You know, they need more hints about, hey, have you reviewed your resume? Have you ironed your suit? You know, things like that. And similar to academics, I think if, if we say be sure to check in with your student about academics, they're going to say, how are classes? And the student's going to say, good. But we need to give them more hints. And so I think what a good partner to the task list would be are things to ask your student throughout the time. So whether that's in, you know, August, right before move in or within the first month or, you know, before you come to family weekend, um, talk to your student about these things. I think I think that's really important. Um, as far as specific tasks, um, along with register for family. Well, hold on a second. I can interrupt you because it's okay. fun, fun here. Yes. Um, I love what you said. You know why I love it so much is I don't know if you remember, there was that lady uh, that sat across from us at Ahab that has these cards, these icebreaker yeah. cards. I got in touch with her. And I actually, it's so funny you're saying this because I, I feel like people may think this is canned. It is not. She said, well, I have these cards and I opened up one of them. One of them was like, have you spoken to your child about how they made their own dentist appointment? But it was a nice breaker of responsibility. And I said to her, I was like, could we just have like an e version of that? So like, as soon as they attend orientation, the parent gets like a text message, sign in and you see this icebreaker. You can buy the cards if you want to, you can get the cards to begin the conversation. You said something a little different, start the conversation without periodization, but then you also said before family weekend, you may want to have an icebreaker about that before commence, you know, all these different things. I see a natural hybrid approach of that. So as you said, I'm turning it towards you, David. We want to start stacking that content um, of those icebreakers, but also, I, and this is not shameless too, you're writing a book and you, you did these things. We've been approached by other people to say, can you suggest books to parents? that has nothing to do with periodization, basically, but it says this is suggested reading. This is content that may be important to you. So you talked about the icebreakers. Why don't we talk about your book a little bit? Sure. Sure. Um, so we're now working on book number three or four, depending on how you look at it. Um, but starting back last year, uh, 2021, so that's almost two years ago now, um, I edited a book uh, called College Ready. So this book was specifically for parents preparing to send their student to college. So that summer before period. And there are plenty of books out there that cover this. Uh, this book, you know, the publisher and my goal was to make it kind of short and easy to read. We know that there's a lot to go on. So we didn't want anecdotes and stories. We really wanted to be like, here's what you need to do to be prepared to send your student to college. And so I reached out to my colleagues in the field who do what I do, and each one wrote a different chapter, and I edited it all together, and we came up with College Ready. And that is, it's renewed every single year, so the 2023 version will be coming out this spring, um, hopefully late winter, early spring. And then from that, th that's also been translated into Spanish. So that's why I say it's kind of three or four, depending on how you count. So that is also available in Spanish. Uh, and then we decided to expand this series. And the next one we wrote was post-college ready, which has to do with the transition out of college, which I think is very exciting because, you know, right now we're talking about that handoff and that transition. And there's not much out there about how parents can support their student in the job search or how a parent might feel if their student wants to go to grad school or maybe move to another country and volunteer. You know, parents might be like, wait, you just worked on this degree. Why are you making these choices? Or, you know, how do you feel if your student moves home after graduation? And so that book really covers that and helping parents with that transition. So it's really meant for parents in their senior year. 
And now the new book that we're working on right now that is set to come out in May is College Sophomore Ready. So very much what we're talking about right now. So for parents leading into the sophomore year, um, what what are what is different about the sophomore year? What why are maybe students more challenged in their sophomore year? How is it different? Um, what happens with their friend groups? What happens with their academics? Um, mental health is a really big topic in the sophomore year book. Um, knowing that as classes get harder and maybe they're separated from their group of friends last year, there's going to be more challenges. So we are currently working on that book. I'm really excited about it. Uh, the whole series. Uh, every chapter, you know, we were just talking about conversation starters. And so that was something that was really important to me in this book. Every single chapter ends with conversation starters specific to that topic for the parents to use with their students. And it's, you know, I actually did receive a message from somebody that said that, you know, one of their friends had gave them this big book about how to prepare their student for college and it was too intimidating. And then they got my book and sat and read it in one night. And that was really great to hear because you might get the book and be like, wait, how can there be so much valuable information in a book that's this thick? But it is it is very valuable to families, I think, and especially because we're expanding it to talk about that transition into other years. Well, I'm very passionate about this stuff. And, you know, I spoke to some other uh, professionals earlier this morning and the last couple of weeks, and they always think, oh, aren't you afraid to say what you're coming out with? You're a technology company. Someone's going to steal your stuff, and you're going to have copyright intellectual problems, like, all these different crazy things going on. I'm at the point, and my company is very strong. All of us together have agreed that we want to share what we're doing. So I'm going to tell you something we're doing. We just don't have content to deliver on. We have these email addresses and cell phone numbers of these parents during on that supporter platform. So we're talking about January, February, March, April, May, June, July. You see where I'm going. We could stage out if we had your book or this lady's, uh, this other company's uh, icebreaker cards, a simple text message could go out and say, hey, have you spoken to your child about their dentist appointment? Have you spoken to your child about their taxes or you know, those type of things? Um, I could see getting that content written in the book a little more relevant to the period. I always bring it back to periodization. I apologize. It's a big argument about task lists. People hate them. People love them. But um, I think there is a, a point in time of relevancy where it could be good because maybe the parent hasn't had that newsletter or email or text message sent out in a week. We all know cadence is important. Saying relevant is very important. Um, so I, I'll probably bring up the, the content delivery stuff in another episode, but you just brought that in. So I'm going to absorb that and bring it back to the team that I, I think that's a great idea that you have, you have all that content broken out the end of every chapter and those icebreakers. I think that could be of great use. Um, before we, we go a little further, it's only because you added it. Um, you talked about the offboarding. Uh, we brought that up in the last video podcast. I'm bringing that up. So this is going to be a little longer than I thought today. Uh, but I, I, that topic is very important to me, and I'll tell you why in a bit. But thank you for bringing that up. Uh, but back to that gap before we get to the sophomore year. So you said, you know, content, you had, you know, the delivery of books, um, information. But prior to that family weekend, uh, what you said the parents before had heard something maybe about I'm guessing money matters or mental um, health awareness. Do you think maybe some of those tasks items should be items that they revisiting content that was delivered to them? I mean, do you know what content you would want to deliver that needs to be revisited? Yeah, I think mental health is a huge one. I mean, if I had to pick one thing that I would want to cover over and over again with my families, it would definitely be mental health. And I think because we know, especially now, it is a bigger and bigger issue with our college students, and it's literally life and death, and you can't mess with that. Like, you can fail out of a class, but mental health is so serious, and, you know, I, I just think that, again, you don't know your student is dealing with it until they're dealing with it, so anyway, we can make sure they get that content right away, and also understand how to recognize signs in their students so they know when to reach out to, for help, so they know when a phone call or a text will do or when they need to, you know, reach out to public safety um, and how to support their student through that, any mental health. And, you know, I think we hear mental health and we think a big crisis, but it could be as, as, you know, it could be stress. Like I'm feeling really stressed. Okay. Well, how are you sleeping? Are you eating well? Are you going to the gym? It doesn't have to be a crisis every time, um, but it is something we are all seeing on, on campuses. So I think that is a huge one. Um, for me personally, working at RIT, we are a co-op institution. So the other thing that is very stressful for our families is that co-op and career readiness piece. Um, and I think, you know, for us, it's co-op, but I think for any school, it is the career readiness. You know, you are giving an education, but what does that mean when they walk out of those doors? 
And so whether it's an internship or a co-op or whether it's helping students understand to write, how to write a resume or helping them understand how to use their engagement opportunities as something they can talk about in a job interview, I think that is, is really important too and something that I would like to bring up uh, with my families throughout their time here. Okay, so part of uh, today's interview is for me to get a better idea of how to service supporters better beyond Family Weekend. And I think you gave me some insight up to Family Weekend, and I'm very appreciative of that. Um, I will probably, uh, as we're talking here, think of a couple other questions around that. But I want to, people to understand and you to understand even a little further why, most people have asked me this, so the question is, why do you even care about second year, David, and your company? You're just onboarding. Well, something happened to us. Um, I love OLs, that's why I asked you that question. Orientation leaders, I think, are the front line. I think they begin the communication. I think they have the capacity to continue that into second, third, fourth, and fifth year as peer mentors, I think, into the customer uh, service model of those institutions. And they're kind of forgotten about. And I met with the VP of enrollment, Nathan First, at UConn. His vision is taking those OLs through the full, a whole life cycle of the school to continue to help in what they're doing. But where we fit in as a technology company is we wanted to start recruiting for OLs during the onboarding process. That seems natural. You guys have a great product for onboarding, have an online app you know, for recruiting. Then we had the admissions piece. Most people we don't know that we do online applications for other universities, but today's scope is onboarding. So we, we put our technology in for the application process, so there was an approval and acceptance. So the span of someone using our product got into when recruiting starts in September and then October for OLs. There was a stop there too. So Family Weekend was a hard stop in periodization. OL was a stop. And so someone said to us, like, hey, David, can we build a platform out of your orientation leaders and begin training them? And that periodization for an OL now goes to them becoming sophomores, then becoming peer mentors. And I was like, I remember what Chelsea said during that speech when I was at AHEP. This is why I want to interview. And you actually brought up the book about you know, the importance of sophomores and you know, the things that you want to do. But I wanted to let you know why I'm asking that is because our product is growing in both directions. All the way, we do upward bound, which is eighth grade, we're touching students and parents because the parents have to submit their tax information, they have to do all these things. We get them, in a good way, get them in eighth grade, now all the way to family weekend, and now getting into, into offboarding, which we'll talk about later. It's kind of a cool little thing that's growing organically in the ecosystem that we can develop. So what I want to learn from you is we've talked up the family weekend. You know why I'm asking beyond now what, what's going on. Tell me about sophomores. What am I missing here? I, I mean, I just want to say I love that it's growing the way it is. And I know you have a text platform and I think it's it's so great because even if like you, you said this earlier, we can just send a text like, hey, remember to talk about this or hey, this conversation starter went out in your newsletter. Be sure to, to watch it. And I just think that's that's so cool that there are so many ways we can reach both families and students and get them connected to our university and to all these wonderful resources. So about sophomores, it's, I think you mentioned two things that I, I think are interesting. One is the OL piece. And I love the idea of getting them engaged early and using the platform to help train them in terms of families. I would love for OLs to under, better understand how to work with families. Cause I think you're right. They're the front line and we have so much potential there. One thing that I think, that a lot of institutions are missing is talking to students about how to work with parents. So I talk to parents every day about how to have conversations with their students and how to support them. But we don't talk to our students about how do you have a difficult conversation with your parent? How do you, how do you talk to your parent if you fail the class or if you're not happy here, or if you have an issue? And, and I think that is a huge gap in our work. And I don't think we should put that pressure on OLs, but I do think OLs as peer, peer, peer leaders, can be really a place where we train them and say, hey, you might want to talk to your OL group, even at orientation, about what they might experience with their families and, and what has worked for you. Or, you know, I, I always tell the OLs when I do my training every year, if you have time, you you tell your students to, like, take out their phone and take a selfie and send it to mom and dad or a supporter because it'll take 30 seconds of your time, but it will mean the world to the family member back home. And so helping OLs understand that like that is part of their role is helping to engage students, I think is a really good start. I think we could do more than that, but that's a really good start. It's, uh, I keep saying it's funny, uh, but it is. It's maybe ironic, whatever phrase it is, as long as we don't bust on Alanis Morissette, right? Um, uh, I mean, I don't know how good is your singing voice. I'd like to hear that. Uh, so I do Millie Vanilli, that's it, so. 
<laughs> don't make me get into that. That requires a separate evening. Um, the uh, other video podcast we did was with Sarah Dodge from UVA. We talked about name tags, and I know that's a boring topic, but it's not. Um, it's about real estate on something, but also developing the sense of belonging with something tangible. And on the guest part of the name tag is the supporter, but you can also put the OL's information on that as a point of contact. So developing that relationship with the OL is what you're talking about, training these OLs to begin that. A lot of them don't know that. A lot of them probably didn't have a supporter themselves and don't understand that. But the whole point of the training, I like what you're saying, is saying stories and making relevant, you know, relevant uh, situations of that uh, belonging. Um, okay, so I I'm understanding the sophomore side and the book that you wrote, what did it really address? Just so I can, I'm a parent, you know, I have two kids, my son's 12, but he'll be going to college soon. But what would I, as a parent, get out of the book? So are you asking about the sophomore year book? Yeah. Okay, so it's being written. I, ah. I can tell you the topics, but not specific content because it's all in the hands of my contributors right now. Um, but I will tell you, it. we really started off with why is sophomore year different? I think you have to start with that. Why is this? A, why is the sophomore slump real? And what are the challenges? And what can you, as a parent, do to support it overall? Um, we have, uh, I think, three chapters on academics. So very specifically, what are some of the challenges, and what students should be doing to overcome those challenges? And I think it's really important to go beyond this subject matter is hard, but really talk about time management and keeping a calendar and talking to advisors and professors. Um, you know, we talk a lot about changing a major that happens a lot in the second year or for some schools selecting a major. Uh, we also talk about study abroad. That is something that might not happen in the sophomore year, but it's something that students are starting to think about and we want them to prepare for that. Um, that's, that's twice you've mentioned that because you said that in offboarding. You're like, these people may go to different. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. OK, I'm taking notes of all this stuff because I have a lot of questions. Sure, Sorry. sure. No, nope, that's okay. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have a, a couple chapters on mental health, um, knowing that that's a huge thing, and we want parents to know what their student might be experiencing and what signs to look out for if their student is struggling. Uh, and we also cover the social aspect of the second year. So moving off campus, that is something that sophomores do. And if they don't do it in that year, I think, you know, when we're talking about these middle years, it can be challenging because not all students are on the same trajectory. So what some students experience in their sophomore year, others might ex not experience until their junior year. But the benefit of having it in the sophomore year book is it will help parents be prepared whenever it happens. Uh, so moving off campus, you know, how do you negotiate with a landlord? How do you um, think about transportation to campus and to the grocery store? Do you know how to cook? Do you know how to not, you know, start your microwave on fire when you're owning your apartment or renting your apartment? And that's a little bit different than in the, the residence halls. Uh, also, friendships, I think, is something really important to talk about. You know, your first year, you oftentimes are friends with the people you live with, but then that changes. And so you suddenly have to make time for people or maybe you realize those friendships aren't worth it. And um, so I think talking about the change in relationships in those years is important, including, you know, we're talking to parents. How will a parent feel if their student doesn't want to come home for Thanksgiving because they want to go to a partner's house? So talking about romantic relationships becoming more serious, more serious in that year. And then the other thing that I forgot to mention is we do talk a lot about family belief or there's one full chapter on family belief systems. And so and what happens when a student, you know, comes home with a nose ring or comes home and is suddenly vegan or comes out and how can a family or maybe comes home and says, I'm pagan now. I was raised Catholic and now I'm pagan and really helping parents understand what that means and how they can support their student and, you know, things to think about. So we, we cover a lot of topics in the, in this book um, that I, I think are very valuable. I'm really excited to see what our contributors write. Yeah, I mean, you're creating a foundation laying the groundwork of, you said every year you're going to be adapting this maybe? Yes. And I think that's important because to me, it goes back to the phrase I said we talk about, a content delivery, of having relevant content to the times too. And that was something Marge and I talked about that's such a challenge on her side that every year kept changing the pandemic came. She's like, David, I know that was a major change, but there was always change every year that we were always adapting to. Like, your all's jobs are so challenging. Like, I have a deep appreciation for that. Um, the people listening right now uh, are getting the insight for the sophomore, sophomore year. Um, I, I, I kind of want to stop and ask you a personal question about you in a good way. Okay. Um, I, if anyone's listening here, Chelsea's an awesome person. She has this little pointer with a finger. I saw her. Do you have it there? There you go. They sure um, do. <laughs> it, 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 as famous as you know, certain things have become, 
tell us a little, little bit behind that pointer because I know it's going to come up later. Sure, sure. So um, I have been very, very fortunate in my career to have a wonderful group of people to be my supporters and my mentors. So, um, you know, if there's AHEP members listening, they know what we're talking about. Those who don't, AHEP is, you know, the professional organization for family engagement. And I happened to, Marge, who I mentioned earlier, is one of the founders. And so through Marge, I got to meet a lot of the founders and they have been just unbelievably supportive of me as I've grown in my career. And as I've been involved in AHEP, I have, what's, what's the date today? I have, you know, 16 more days left in my presidency of AHEP. And so this past, this past conference that in November when we were in Orlando, where I got to meet David, was my outgoing conference as the president. And some of the founders came to support me in that. And my dear friend and colleague, Dini from Dallas, uh, brought me the pointer. Um, so I could, you know, be in the room and, and point at people. And I took it to heart and I brought it with me to everything all conference long. And now it's just become part of me. So I keep it in my office and sometimes I play with it. Sometimes I bring it to meetings, but that was, it's a silly, fun, you know, memory that I'll always have now. And you're not the first person who's brought it up since Ahab. So apparently it, it, it's, it has stuck with a lot of people. <laughs> Well, hopefully it doesn't define you down the road like you have to keep using it, but keep using it. Uh, I actually went on Amazon and I uh, uh, shameless, uh, I bought some. Well, I'm, not, I'm not using it in this because it's your thing, but I think it's effective too because it, it grabs attention for a moment when someone has a fleeting thought, brings them back to you know the conversation. I think it's really cool. A couple things uh, popped out about your personal life uh, that are very important to me, and that's why I'm bringing it up, aligned is I love to read books. If anyone actually had been listening to any of the podcasts beforehand, before we got to video, I, I, I took pride. I'm like, I'm on book 56 right now. And then I read your email that you sent me. You said 111. I felt I am small. Um, and uh, I, one of my really good friends, she's a lawyer up in Richmond. Uh, and earlier this year, she told me, and it kind of, and that's what inspired me too. Uh, she's on book 100. I said you had done 111. She said 112 this morning. I'm like, no, 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 no. Uh, that can't be the case. But she's close to where you are. Mm -hmm. But she had some questions that I, I kind of want to ask you, if you don't mind, since we sure. have a little bit. Uh, because as many as she has read, I know why I picked my books. Mm -hmm. But how did you pick what's the next book? So when you finished a book, how did you know what was next? That's a great question. So I will confess that one of the reasons I get through as many books as I do is because I do a lot of audiobooks. So, um, you know, I love to cycle. And so when I'm biking, I'll listen to an audiobook. Or when I'm walking my dog, I will listen to an audiobook. So that's part of the reason why I get through so many books. And I also listen to them on double speed because they're way too slow and they're on, on normal speed. So that is that has helped me get through so many books. And it's how do I pick my next book? Sometimes it's just, I need a book right now, what's available. And otherwise I have a lot of friends who are also really big readers and we do a lot of book sharing and a lot of recommendations. And I love reading so much that when I bought my house back in 2019, one of the first things I got was a free little library for my front yard. And so it is very active. I, I love those things. I, I see do, them all the time. Yeah. I do too. So I check it at least once a week to see if there's anything new in there that I can grab and read before passing it back out to the community. I also know where all the neighborhood ones are. And so my dog gets to walk by them all the time and I make her stop so I can look for good books. So that's, that helps to have friends who are readers so we can share. No and then the next question before we get back on topic, because I, I love this stuff is what book surprised you the most? Oh man. Or one of them. That's a really good question. I I don't know what surprised me the most, but I want to share about the book that I just finished last night. Um so it's called The Booth Girls and it's a it's a nonfiction about a a woman whose mother um back in the sixties became pregnant and had to be sent away to this home to have her baby and gave her up for adoption. And um the reason I read it is, first of all, when I was doing my master's work, I was really interested in adoption research and worked on an adoption project for a while. And I thought the whole thing was very fascinating. But also the Booth House was actually right around the corner from the house that my mom grew up in in St. Paul, Minnesota. Wow. And so when I'd go visit my grandma, you know, there was this big fancy house that I didn't know what it was. I just remember my mom always saying that was the home for unwed mothers. And so my mom got this book and read it and then gave it to me. And it was really cool to read, to pull in my family social science background, but also understanding every city she named and every street she named, I knew it because it was, you know, 
my the neighborhood I lived in before I moved out here to New York. So I don't know that that book was surprising, but it was really fun to read something that pulled in my, you know, education, passion, and also, you know, my love for my my home in St. Paul and bringing back that familiarity. Have you picked the next book? I have a couple that I downloaded on my phone for my trip home. I'm going to visit my family um, later this week. So I actually don't remember what they are because I picked them and I'm really excited to read them, but I don't, I can't even tell you what they are. <laughs> It's so funny. I will go reading through a book and I want to get so fast to the end because I want to read the next book. But the last chapter I read so slow because I don't want the book to yes. <laughs> end. Well, and I'm a, I'm a big fiction reader, but I'll tell you, I have a pile of books right here that I recently bought that are related to my, my work. And so I'm hoping starting in the in January, you know, the new semester to really make sure I'm taking time for my own professional development and not just reading fun books, but reading educational books, too. So I bring that to my work as well, that love for reading. Well, it's funny. I'm going to bring Marge back into this. Uh, did you hear the whole story, how I got the podcast interview with her? I don't think so. Because uh, uh, at that time, uh, Baylor University is one of, just became one of our clients. And uh, last year on LinkedIn, uh, uh, with a director out there, and I guess I can say their names, Daniel and Nathan, and he posted something of this book. It was Marge's book. And I thought he had read it. I didn't pay attention. I just screenshot it because I was on the airplane and because I was, you know, going back to Texas here, I read the whole book, got so excited. I was going to surprise him on LinkedIn. I found Marge, got in touch with her. I was like, this is such a great book. Uh, can I interview you? Get the podcast going. Got the podcast done. Called back Baylor and both of them, uh, Nate and Daniel. And I was like, hey, uh, I got surprised for you all. I just did a video podcast with Marge. And they're like, who is she? <laughs> and then Marge knows about this. It was yeah. just funny. But that was the landmark of the first real uh, podcast that we did with Marge in the book. But hearing your story about the book and your books, uh, books are paramount to me, and I think they're very important. And I look forward to reading your soft. I didn't know you were not done with it yet. Yeah. But it's, uh, I want I want a copy with the signature uh, when Absolutely. you guys are done. I can make that happen. Yep. Uh, I I want to don't want to leave out a special guest, Lottie. You keep talking oh, about your dog. Lottie, my dog. She is the light of my life. I, before I got her, I always thought it was silly when people said their dog was their best friend. Oh no, she's absolutely my best friend. <laughs> oh, hopefully we get to see her at the next conference or something like that. Oh, that would be great. That would be great. <laughs> okay. Uh, a little bit about getting back on topic. Uh, so the sophomore thing that we're talking about, I, I want to go over an idea and concept. Um, and now we're going to go over numbers a bit. Binghamton and NCAT, uh, Binghamton and Betsy said, about over 60% of the parents that came to Family Weekend were incoming parents from the VZO platform. Over 90% from NCAT were incoming students on our platform. And then immediately we're talking about what they wanted to do next year. And I just caught them off guard. And I said, you have 90% captive engagement of people using that registration system, checking in because we have QR code, we have all that thing. They get text messages when they're there. Why not continue that engagement right afterwards and take that 90% capture, continue those as those students get in the sophomore year to the next family weekend and re-engage them back? So as you build this pipeline of, you can start from scratch, consider this year one. If, year, uh, if the previous year, year 21 of family weekend wasn't that good, but 22 was really good, imagine 23 could only be better because you're stacking on top of what you had done previously. This gets aligned with the orientation leader platform that if you don't have a strong pipeline for orientation leaders, but you started this year recruiting and training and doing it, that first year becomes the second year. It started that longevity of the student life cycle. Um, so with those alarming numbers, if you could have that cliff, if I said, Chelsea, from the VZO product, you have all this data, you have all these family members, what do you do with it? Look at your crystal ball and say, this is, these are ideas I, I may have. Yeah, you know, I would, I think that, I, I think I kind of mentioned this before. I think reminders are so great to continue on. It doesn't maybe have to be as heavy of a lift as it is leading up to that first family weekend. Um, but just knowing that naturally families are going to use college resources less and less as their student gets older. Again, I think that's development, developmentally appropriate and normal. But to help them remember, like, hey, we have this, come back to the family weekend. Um, we want to see you your second year. Or even if it's like, hey, we know your student is nearing graduation. Come back for one last family weekend. Um, I think that could be a really great resource to continue to engage them 
Or like I mentioned earlier, if you know you have a newsletter or have a web page saying, hey, we have this new resource that is a website just for parents of second year students. We want you to know what questions to ask your student as they're going through this year, you know, just to kind of ping them when you have, like you say, you have that active audience. So, and I think also once parents get that engagement, they want it, they really value it. And it doesn't have to be every week. In fact, I think that's, that's a lot. And, but it could be here and there just as reminders, you know, be sure to check your student's final schedule before you book their flights home. You know, like it, it could be a lot of things like that. And I think there's a lot of potential with your, with your uh, platform and these schools that are already so engaged and, and have those high numbers of engaged parents. Cool, because I, I feel like we're in a box. I'm going to stretch your brain out a bit, okay? We have a big whiteboard now. It's huge. Glass okay. ceiling on the roof. The issue we had with orientation and engagement with parents, it fell into a mold of sending emails, sending reminders, text messages. But what was lost was engagement, true engagement. So we added it. That's what we brought to the game better than anybody else at this moment. And that's we hope the whole industry shifts. Not only VZ is doing it, we hope other people start doing it because it's the future. The engagement is actionable items, registering for an event, attending a seminar, a webinar and such. I understand resources are so important. This is where I'm stretching your brain. And I'm, I myself is so finite that I need your help. You have family weekend. If next year is family weekend, that's a whole year. What other type of events, not, not like every family member would go to, what other events occur during that period of year that parents could be engaged in, like in spring or summer? Yeah, I think um, there are a lot of events that happen on campus that could be appropriate for them to come and enjoy with their students. It it all varies by institution, obviously. Um, but I think engagement doesn't just have to be events. So that's what I think about. Um, so for example, I have a poll on my website. It's a monthly poll and parents love it. And that is an engagement opportunity to say, hey, we just want to get your information or we want to get your insight on this one quick question. And so that's not an event, but it's a way to keep parents connected to your institution. I also use it as a reminder. So instead of just saying, hey, talk to your student about registered re- registering to vote, I might use a poll that says, hey, how is your student going to vote? Are they going to vote on campus? Are they going to vote absentee? And so that is a really, really good way to engage families. Uh, I think also another thing that I've done, and I'm not the only person who's done this, is create a cookbook. And so collecting recipes from families is a really cool way to engage them. And then at RIT, everybody does it different. At RIT, we collect recipes for students and then sell this cookbook for a really cheap cost for students who are learning how to cook. And so it seems silly, but asking parents for their family fa- favorite family recipe to pass on to other students is really a really wonderful engagement opportunity with those families. Because one of the things that we uh, incurred with that, because that could even be a social media thing more than a platform supporting, because there's things that absorb that. Uh, There's been a problem, though, with Facebook groups or other social media groups of which one is really um, advocated by the university rather than an upset parent or someone with different purposes. Uh, So do you use social media for any of your... uh, Engagement? Yes. We have a Facebook Facebook page, and that is actually run by my student employees. So um, I obviously work with them on content, but they do a lot of pictures, a lot of videos, um, really helping parents understand the student experience. I will say we keep more of our serious content to the newsletter so that Facebook can be a more fun way to understand campus and the student experience. Uh, we do we do not run it, but there is an unofficial group with our parents that I steer clear of because I do not think that is a place for me or staff to be because as soon as it is, it becomes official and then it right. becomes a full time job. And so, uh, you know, I just stress to parents if they if they come to me and say, well, I heard this on the unofficial group, you know, the answer is, well, I can give you the official answer. You know, remember that unofficial groups are great to hear ideas for, you know, bed sizes or gifts or experiences, but that's not going to be the official university policy or procedures. So, you know, I think the the benefit of having a platform like yours rather than using social media is we're going through a kind of a generational shift of parents. So I have found that right now uh, our current population of parents are still using Facebook, but what's going to happen in the next few years? Mm-hmm. They're, you know, we, are, we know our students don't use Facebook. And so our parents are probably switching to Instagram, but then what's going to happen in a few years? They're going to switch to another social media um, 
platform. So what happens when you have to cons- consistently shift and do you completely change it or do you keep both alive? And that's a lot of work for an institution. Um, and so I appreciate a platform like yours because it can be a place where parents go to create a community rather than, you know, having to as staff figure out what, what are parents using and how do we utilize the best way to reach them. Because the uh, interesting aspect this is where the tech comes in. It, it may sound great you have a parent engagement platform, but if that student's no longer enrolled at the university or something bad happened and you received that engagement, that's a challenge. But the power yes. of what we are bringing, and this is why the CI, I met with a couple CIOs recently. I have one actually at one o'clock today, um, talking how to extend our lifecycle product for the whole span. This is where the second part of the conversation is coming into. Um, we don't do that. We're not a CRM. We're not going to become a CRM. We're not a SIS, which is a student information system like Banner or PeopleSoft. But you know what Visual Zen does is we integrate, we always have integrated with those systems. So that's why they're looking at us as a layer on top. So it makes sense if we extend that life cycle to what you're talking about. How cool would it be of Family Weekend just ended, right? They got a text message saying, hey, here's this... uh, uh, new cooking, be part of this new cooking recipe group or something mm-hmm. like this. Uh, but we're actively hooking back in to make sure that student didn't drop out, you know, for spring. Mm-hmm. And because we deal with pre-advising, and I want to get your take on advising a little later, I don't know if we have time, um, that we can determine what classes they're enrolling in, is it the right classes they're enrolling in. Maybe a parent needs to know that, hey, by the way, we found out that there's a change and shift of the curriculum your students getting into. So there's a lot of things going on with that platform of other than just import your data in as a flat file, here's your mailing list, here's a newsletter going on. It is now being synced up to this university system of uh, is the data still there? Is the student still active? Is the parent still part of that? And what we haven't talked about is alumni. And I know that may not be anything strategically. I don't see that anywhere in the documentation here. When I say documentation, I have notes on everything. I call that my documentation. What role does alumni play in what you do in part of family programs? Uh, I mean, that's a great question. I, Other than just having partnerships on campus, I do not do a lot with alumni or, or that piece. But I think uh, strategically and kind of philosophically where it plays a role is that You know, parents might not have the capacity to give, but if they feel engaged in the institution, they are certainly going to pass that excitement and that engagement onto their student. And so hopefully helping, you know, the student understand, like, you got a great education from this place. You should stay connected as an alum. And, you know, at the end of the day, the parent probably won't stay unless they are an alum themselves. They probably won't stay connected to our the institution once the student graduates. But like I said, I think they can pass that excitement along and, and help their student understand how they can stay active as as an alum. And, you know, I think that student engagement and parent engagement piece works together. And so it's it's modeling and it's encouraging. Yeah, because we have an, uh, a term here. It's, it's loose. We don't even know if it's the right term. We call it adopted alumni. Every supporter that has a, st- a student that graduates becomes the adopted alumni afterward. The whole family becomes part of that. They mm-hmm. all go to football games together. They all wear their sweatshirt, whatever, you know, if you have football games. Um, that whole concept of that. But what we learned was something called early alumni, where they're actually part of the orientation process to mm-hmm. help the student's success but they're not talking about supporter success. And so that's something new that we're bringing to the table next year is how to talk to family programs, as you said, campus partners, right, strategically, how to bring in alumni now in development and say, take this a little seriously, that if we can manage the engagement as an ecosystem of the university, not just of one department, we could probably increase that level of success and longevity. I know we've gone a lot through uh, today. It's 55 minutes or 58. But I, I want to ask you about this offboarding thing because you brought it up. It's almost, it makes sense now. We're at the end of talking about it. Yeah. But before I jump to the offboarding, is there anything you wanted to bring up about the sophomore insight? I think you've asked really great questions and we've talked a lot about it. So. Okay, so let's jump to the offboarding. Uh, I'm going to tell you why it piqued my curiosity. In the last uh, podcast we did with Betsy and Nicole on Family Weekend, I asked them this question. If we turn the orientation upside down right now and stuck your department as offboarding for the university, how would your role function then? And it was interesting to see their response. Right. It was kind of cool because you can watch the recording later and see it. 
But it, what it is is letting people know that offboarding and onboarding happens all the time in every business and every part of life. You're on your own, you're on your own path, right? So uh, a journey, a rite of passage. Talk to me about your idea of offboarding since you brought it up. Sure. I think, um, you know, you know, as a, I'm a family researcher at heart, right? That's what my degree is in. And I just, I really understand the value of families and I know it doesn't, parenting doesn't end when your kid goes to college. Parenting doesn't end when your kid gets their college degree. Parenting doesn't end when your kid gets married or has their own babies. Like parenting is something you have to do your whole life. And there should be this natural shift, right? From the day they're born until the day you're gone of how your parenting shifts. And I just think, you know, just because your your child is an adult doesn't mean that your parenting ends. And so offboarding to me is really helping parents. It, it's the cap of the onboarding. Like, here's how you parent a college student. But then it's like, here's how you you continue to help your college student become an adult. And here's how you support them as an adult. Um, I can understand there might be questions about if that's our job or not. Uh, but I think as, you know, a family, as a, as a family researcher and a family professional, I think it's really important to help parents understand that. They are still important. And even if it's just answering that call and listening to their, you know, graduate talk, I think it's important and helping them understand that they still play a very supportive role. And, you know, like I had said before, helping their student find a job. They're not the ones writing the resume, but they can sure help them understand how to negotiate a job offer, Mm -hmm. you know, or helping them understand, like, if their student had to move across or their graduate had to move across the country for a job and they're calling them and saying, I'm super lonely, they can say, well, let's talk about what you did in college to make friends. Maybe you could do that now. And so I just, that's what it looks like for me as a family professional is helping them understand they're important and we value them and their student is going to value them into adulthood and into graduation. Well, talk about periodization and talk about future. So this has not been done yet. Well, kind of has, um, uh, what uh, Visual Zen has done a lot of things over the years, and because we have our own developers, our own customer support team, our own employees, uh, we could take on any project. It's kind of cool, but that's not financially always great. So right. uh, we, uh, we, we, there's a division of our company we call Pixels Off. That's our innovation tank. That's like 20% playtime. You know, like to figure out things. Uh, but the, one of the reasons we changed our product name from VZ Orientation to VZO is because we got asked to do alumni. And also for medical schools, we helped with graduation, and that's offboarding. So it wasn't onboarding; it was offboarding. So it was a point of another event occurring, like you have orientation sessions, you know, happening on maybe family weekend, but on the tail end, now you have an event that's ending the journey of the student. Why not six to eight months beforehand prep them for that journey of offboarding? Uh, so I'm kind of leaving that open ended in the sense that we have no idea what's going on, and I'm hoping that you know, with your research and you know what you're doing. Um, that we can gain some insight on how you feel. Because once we get a little more from alumni, I'm going to ask all of our clients and all our connections and say, let's bring alumni to the table and see what they have to say. Because I can tell you, the registrar is also interested in that too. Because guess what the registrar wants? They want to use, or not just registrar, the advising component, component. They want enrollment for classes to be predicted for class sizes. I said that in the beginning. So that's resource management. And then for the first onboarding year, it's just a part of it. Supporter engagement is just a part of it the incoming year. But every year, if you're looking at um, engagement and enrollment of doing that, that just seems more of a natural flow to keep the supporters involved, to keep you know alumni involved uh, to curate that. Um, okay, well, this has been exactly what we needed, a good hour of... Uh, I'm happy uh, to <laughs> Yeah, and in true fashion, uh, we like to end the show on one thing. Uh, basically, what that is is the audience here has heard a lot. They probably push pause, play to the power of now. What I've done in Vimeo by making chapters, you know, they're skipping back and forth. But the final chapter is, are your words. Um, they don't have to be aligned to the topic, but we do like it aligned to our purpose: building better pathways for student and supporter success. So this is where, in a few moments, I'm gonna, you know, say I'm I'm done and pass mm-hmm. the baton to you. This is your chance, Chelsea. And Chelsea, thank you very much. Anything you ever need from us, uh, we'll be there for you. And here I go. Zip it. All right. Well, I appreciate that. And when you first told me I had this time, I was thinking about what I was going to say, and then I forgot. So everything I say right now is off the cuff. But, you know, you had brought up a couple of the things that I sent you in my message to you about my personal life. And so what really stands out to me right now is the importance of self-care and boundaries. You know, I think we could all work a million hours a day if we could. And I think in order to be the best we can be to our students and to our our supporters and to 
each other, we need to remember to take care of ourselves. And, you know, I also talked about mental health and how that's an issue with our students, but I think it's an, an issue for everyone. And so, you know, I sent you the list of here's, here's who I am outside of work. And that's really important to me that I make time for those things because it makes me happy and healthy so that when I come to work, I can give everything to my job. And so I think if I could encourage, you know, anybody listening and especially younger professionals is to make sure you make time for that. And if you have to turn off your phone and go read a book, turn off your phone and go read a book. Or if you need to go walk your dog, um, walk your dog. And sometimes I walk my dog while I'm on a meeting and that's great too. And so just make sure to find time for you and, and, you know, we're all passionate about our jobs, but you can be passionate outside of your job too. And they really complement each other better than you think. So that's, that's kind of my, my soapbox is take care of yourself and have your passions and, and have that support your work rather than work against it.